Now, a few weeks ago, I ran across this interview on the Yale School of Public Health website. And some of the things the interviewee, my guest today, had to say about the not-so-well-known tick-borne disease, Powassan virus, really caught my attention. So joining me now is Derlin Fish, Ph.D. Professor Fish is a professor emeritus of epidemiology at the Yale School of Public Health. Dr. Fish, welcome to the, to the show, sir. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Yes, sir. Now, I was really intrigued by your interview on the Yale website, and I would like to get into some of the, some of the things that you said a little bit later. But right now, I'm down here in Tampa, Florida, and uh, Powassan virus is probably not something that's well-known down here. So I'd like to introduce my audience to the ABCs of Powassan, um, to the general public. And uh, can you uh, give us a little information about what is Powassan virus, and is there a history behind it? Um, yes, this is kind of interesting history behind it. It was first uh, found, isolated actually from a brain of a fatal case in a child from Powassan, Ontario, Canada, back in, I think, 1958. And um, they did some follow-up studies on this uh, virus, and these tick-borne viruses are pretty specific uh, once they have it identified. So they went out and looked in the field to see you know, how this virus is being maintained in nature in the tick population. And, and they found that it was maintained um, by a certain species of tick that's pretty specific for a, a large or medium-sized mammals, uh, mustelid skunks and weasels and things like that. And this, but this tick occasionally would bite people. And the virus was maintained in these uh, wild mammals and in this particular tick species that, again, was fairly host-specific. But occasionally a person would get bitten by one of these ticks and uh, would come down with Powassan virus. And subsequently they found um, areas infected with this virus in, in New York State and other areas in the Northeast and Upper Midwest. Now, it, it is transmitted to humans via ticks, uh, the, essentially the same ones that transmit Lyme disease, Babesia, Anaplasma. Um, is this the only way a person can contract it? Is, is, is it a person-to-person transmission? No, most of these vector-borne diseases are not person-to-person transmitted. You need, a, you need to have a, an insect or, a, in this case, a tick is an intermediate host, so they're very specific like yeah. that. Uh, most of these, uh, uh, you know, mosquito-borne or tick-borne diseases are very specific even to certain species of um, <clears throat> of ticks or mosquitoes. Now, let me go back because you mentioned that, um, that it's transmitted by the same tick that transmits Lyme disease and these other diseases. That is a recent, um, that is a recent phenomenon. Um, the, we did not find the, this virus in that tick species, the deer tick, commonly called the deer tick or the black legged tick. Mm-hmm. Um, in the, in the back in the 70s, when they were looking for um, the causative agent of Lyme disease, there was a, uh, there was a, in uh, uh, the Yale Arbovirus Research Unit, there's a, there were real world experts on vector borne viruses there, and they, and they went up and around Lyme and, and they were convinced that Lyme, Lyme disease was called by a virus. And so they ground up, they looked at, at thousands of ticks uh, and they didn't find any virus in them. So this Powassan virus was not in this deer tick, you know, 30, 40 years ago. Uh-huh. But now it is. And we're not sure exactly what's changed. Certainly the ecology of this deer tick has changed because we know that it's spreading its range throughout the Northeast and Upper Midwest um, and causing an epidemic of Lyme disease and these other associated diseases uh, caused by this tick species and the expansion of its range. So uh, we're not sure exactly what, well, you know, what's going on with this, but uh, there have been some studies showing that uh, you know, up to 3 4% of these deer ticks can be infected with this virus, and that's an alarmingly high percentage. Um, and that's been found in several areas in the Northeast, and that's pretty concerning because um, that's equivalent to what we see in Europe and uh, Russia with uh, another disease called tick-borne encephalitis, sure. which is uh, has been known over there for you know centuries, not centuries, but uh, you know 
decades, mm-hmm. and and to, and it's and it's uh, such a serious disease there that they have a vaccine for it. And in countries like Austria, eighty percent of the people are vaccinated for this tick-borne encephalitis virus. Um, so I, you know, so I don't. We don't know what's going on. I, I don't understand it. We're not. We're not seeing a lot. We're not seeing enough cases right. <laughs> uh, to, to you know, so to correspond to the high prevalence of infection in the ticks. So uh, we're not. We're not sure what's going on. No, and that brings a, a good point. I, I looked at CDC data, and it looks like there's only been seventy, seventy-five cases in the past decade in, in people, and. Um, so it's, well, that's a lot more than the previous decades, though. Sure, so sure. The, but the but, incidence is going up. Yeah. But, yeah, but if you compare it to the other tick-borne uh, infectious diseases, it's quite low. I mean, I, I think the the most you see in a year is maybe a dozen. And uh, so, yeah. what what regions of the country have we been seeing the most cases? In? Well, all right. So historically, it's been in northern areas. You know, Canada. You know, the northern New England states, upstate New York in the upper Midwest, Wisconsin and Minnesota, a sprinkling of cases over the past 30, 40 years. But now with the involvement of the deer tick, you know, we're seeing more cases and we're seeing it in areas where we didn't have it before when it was transmitted by this other wildlife tick species. So we're seeing them now in New Jersey and uh, downstate New York and Connecticut just saw its first case uh, a few, uh, I was just reported a few, a few weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so it's it's spreading. The the, the geographic distribution of this, of this disease is, is expanding. Right. How how far south does it go? Go as far south down as Florida, and if not, what's as, as south as it is uh, been uh, seen? Uh, West Virginia is this is south. Okay. Far south as we've seen it. Yeah. The, yeah. So most of these tick-borne diseases, quite honestly, aren't, aren't don't reach down to to Florida. Okay. Now it's we have mosquito borne diseases. But not tick- oh yeah, yeah, we have we have our share of that, and uh, we're just waiting for some rain, and we'll see what happens after that. Uh, it's pretty dry down here right now. Um, now Powassan virus is really pretty serious too, and and depending on what I read, it's uh, it ranges between the ten to fifteen percent of patients that get it uh, re- actually result in death. Um, Doctor, well, you have to have yeah. You have to look at the right denominator there. So that's so they're they're looking at they're, they're, that's calculated on the basis of the clinical cases. So if someone is sick, you know, and goes to a hospital, you know, uh, then about ten percent of those can result in death, and about fifty percent of them result in some kind of sequelae, some kind of permanent uh, nerve damage. Right. But it seems that a lot of the, a lot of the patients who are bitten by these infected ticks. Don't get sick, or at least get they don't get sick enough to go to the hospital or to see a doctor. And that's, okay. that's the puzzling question: what's okay. happening to those patients? All right. So you're saying there, like with almost every other infectious disease, there's quite a few of asymptomatic infections. Well, that's right. But but again, we haven't done any you know kinds of studies in right. recent times to determine how you know what that what that rate might be. Sure. Now, so. Just to give my audience a, 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 a picture of it, what are the typical signs and symptoms if somebody does have symptoms of Powassan? Well, they usually get a high fever and a headache, you know, within time of a week or up to 30 days uh, after a tick bite. Um, and, that, and that can progress to um, inflammation of the brain, cephalitis or um, aseptic meningitis and, and even coma. Yeah, so, so, so it's a neurologic. It's a it's a it's a you know brain disease, a neurologic disease. And, and, and you would consider this one of the more pathogenic tick-borne uh, agents, uh, as far as far yes. as, as far as causing disease. Yeah. Um, yes. I, I, yes, it looks that way. I mean, plus the fact that there's no treatment for it. Yeah. Um, that makes it a pretty serious disease, something you don't want to get. Yeah. Now, you kind of already discussed this a little bit about concerns about the changing ecology of Powassan. Um, so basically, you're suggesting that the spread of Powassan is inevitable, and we're going to we're gonna see this moving around much like Lyme and Babesia and the others. Yes, I think that's, I think that's very likely to happen. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't. Yeah. 
Now, I, you uh, collaborated in some research a few years ago concerning babesiosis and how it was enhanced, uh, its spread was enhanced thanks to Lyme disease. Um, is Powassan found as a co-infection very often, and is this sort of a deja vu? Well, there, are, you know, there, are, there's really very little data on that. Um, I suspect that that there are ticks with mixed infections out there, uh-huh. uh, um, but the the assays for viruses and the and the bacteria are quite different, so people don't usually do both. But um, but the, the I would suspect, you know, there would be some ticks that had double or maybe even triple infections. How they interact, though, was anyone's guess. I mean, it's, chances are, though, that it's probably not good to, right, right. to get bitten by a tick with, with multiple infections. Right, and well, it's not right now, so, yeah. Um, now, I, this is, I want to get to the most intriguing statement that you made previously. Um, and you said, um, as more ticks become infected with Powassan virus and more people become exposed to them, Powassan could become epidemic like Lyme disease. That's scary in itself. Um, Because it can be a serious disease causing fatalities and there is no treatment for it, Powassan has the potential to become a greater of a public health threat than Lyme disease. That's big, Uh, and I'm sure that's going to grab a lot of attention. And a very strong warning. So, just looking at it from my viewpoint, if Powassan got like Lyme in the U.S., where the CDC, say, CDC says there's 300,000 plus cases annually, and if you're talking about 300,000 plus cases annually of Powassan with 10 to 50% case fatality rate, you're talking about tens of thousands of fatalities. Am I going too far with this or what? Well, that would be you know, an extreme case. I mean, I don't know. So... We're seeing uh, more and more um, infected ticks uh, in the environment. People go out and, and test for ticks. They see, they've seen increases in the percentage of ticks that are carrying Powassan virus in the environment. Okay? And the ticks are also spreading. They're, you know, they're continuing to spread their range, and, and the Powassan is spreading its range in the tick population. So, you know, so all three of those things... Um, point towards, uh, you know, a spreading an epidemic. Uh, if, in fact, uh, you know, the people are getting sick and dying uh, from this disease at the rate that is t- traditionally known for Powassan virus, you know, that could be the case. I don't, I don't think, though, I mean, we, uh, so on the average, about 20% of the ticks are infected with the Lyme disease bacteria. Okay, so that's why you see, you know, 30,000 reported cases a year. So, if, so say 3% uh, of, the, of the ticks would have Powassan virus. You know, you'd, you'd get a tenth of those. But that's still, that's still a lot. Yeah, but, but, I mean, with Lyme disease, the case fatality rate is, is extremely, extremely low. So that, that, would yeah. be, that would be the huge difference, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Well, that's, well, it's not, no, not just the fatality rate. Uh, I'm sorry to say okay. that the people who survive it are probably, you know, could be worse off. Sure, sure. I mean, these, you know, they could have serious neurologic damage and be, you know, really almost, you know, brain dead. Now, all right, Dr. Fish, uh, last thing. Uh, are there, do you have any thoughts on Powassan you'd like to share that we haven't already discussed already? Oh well, you know, I think an aw- I think that an awful lot of work needs to be done on it. Things we don't understand. A lot of, I mean, a lot of, uh, of questions that we have about it. I'd like to see a lot more research. You know, I'm re- you know I'm retired, so I'm not you know, uh, I'm not. This is not a biased opinion because I'm not going to be involved in any more sure. research. But obviously, you know, there should be some concern about this, it, as well as other tick-borne diseases. I mean, they're all increasing. Babesia could could be extreme. Is going Going to be extremely important disease, mm-hmm. probably more important than Lyme disease as, as it spreads as well. So there's a lot going on in terms of the threat of tick-borne diseases, and a lot more research needs to be done. Field research, find out what's what's out there and how it might affect people. That's the key, and then figure out how how we might control it, how we might prevent these these uh, these uh, uh, epidemics. Yeah, speaking of Babesia, I've noticed in the, uh, recently that there's a lot of research going on as far as testing uh, the blood supply. So, I mean, that's oh, that's a step in the no right doubt. direction. Babesia, yeah. is, 
Babesia, babesia is the most important uh, contaminant of the blood bank in this country. Yeah, and and if you're in a certain uh, condition, if you don't have a spleen, that can be incredibly dangerous. Well, my understanding is fifty percent of those blood transfused infections are fatal. Oh yeah, yeah. that's that's just a horrible situation. All right. Well, great. Thank you, Dr. Durland Fish, for your time and expertise, sir. I appreciate it. I'm sorry I can't be more more cheerful. <laughs> oh no, it's okay. I really appreciate what you had to offer. I thank you very much, sir. Okay, you're welcome. All Bye. right. Okay.